Now, one of the things I've argued, and this is very provocative, and I'll put this out there so I can see what you think, and I've written in this book, that patient accounts of madness are a kind of protest literature, and I've compared them to slave narratives, or Holocaust testimonies, where somebody who has been the object of other people's theorizing, like slaves, for example, or Holocaust survivors, stands up and says, no, this is my story. This is how I'm going to tell it. And in that sense, it's a kind of protest literature. So these accounts are not just, let me tell you what's happened to me and how I came to have a madness experience, but really the whole justification for so many people to write these accounts or to give these oral histories or to write blogs about their madness experiences has been to say, psychiatrists do not, are not the only ones who are in a position to make statements with any authority about what's known and what's not known about the mind and how it works. That it's possible, in other words, to write from experience in the same way that slave narratives are now considered by historians to be what historians often call counter-narratives to those of the mainstream. So a historian might write an account of slavery and slave testimonies provide another account. And it's not as if one of them is true and one of them isn't true. They're offering competing, that's why they're calling them counter-narratives, competing accounts of the same thing. So, just to summarize what I've been trying to say thus far, since no mental illness, so-called, has any certain origin, since no one can say for certain, for sure, what causes any kind of psychological difficulty or what can best help a person who's suffering. It's very threatening to the field of psychiatry to have first-person accounts, first of all, to have so many of them, and to have first-person accounts that are really challenging the authority of psychiatry as a medical field. So this is, of course, as we can immediately see, one reason why psychiatrists would not be wanting to pay attention to these first-person accounts, would not even agree that they exist, would certainly not be paying attention to them as an alternative body of material, because they're providing a counter-narrative. Now, if we think about what is that counter-narrative saying, that's really a key part of this story. Because if what patients were writing about in their own first-hand accounts were, you know, how their brain functioning was disturbed and how getting shock treatment or medication or lobotomy or the other treatments that psychiatrists have produced, uh, how those things were helping them, um, then psychiatrists might love these accounts. They might see them as really useful. And of course, there are some books like that. There are some books in which people talk about how a particular medication saved them. These are very important. I don't want to diminish their importance in any way. But they're not the majority of first-hand accounts. The majority of first-hand accounts of madness are critical of psychiatry, are trying to provide an alternative viewpoint and are challenging many of the key ideas that psychiatrists have long held to be true. Let me give you another quote that gives a kind of a striking contrast to Kreplin, who has, remember, said basically that anything somebody who's a schizophrenic patient would ever say is nonsensical, so we don't have to pay any attention to it. Um, you may know the work of uh, Jackie Dillon and Rufus May, um, who are... Uh, contemporary activists in the um, uh, survivor movement. And one of the things they wrote in a very important article a couple of years ago was this. I'm going to quote them. A key to developing an enabling understanding of madness is to see the experiences in question as both valid and meaningful. Madness is a reaction to life events 
Everyone has inherent expertise and wisdom about their life and what is helpful to them. And Rufus and May, uh, uh, Rufus May and Jackie Dillon go on to say, clinical language, that is the language of psychiatry, and they use a very, very strong word, has colonized experiences of distress and alienation. And they argue that in order for people to make sense of what's happened to them, they need to, they use this word, decolonize their experience and create narratives based on what's important to them. Now, this is a very, very strong language to use the language of, especially in Britain, the language of colonization, where, you know, one country goes to another country and says, no matter what your way of life has been over here, now you're going to have our way of life. And we're here to arrive, to put it, put it on your way of life uh, forcibly if necessary. Um, and that's what uh, Dylan and May are basically saying in this article that psychiatry has colonized people's experiences of distress and, and has basically said, you're feeling unhappy? That's not unhappiness. That's something called a chemical imbalance in your brain causing depression. In other words, learn this other language to describe your experience because your language is wrong and this language is right. Now that's a very, very powerful thing to happen to someone because it makes them not only mistrust their own perceptions, but it superimposes on their experience a whole other kind of language that first of all pathologizes it. If you say to someone, you've got a chemical imbalance in your brain, that's not good. It's a problem. And it makes them feel as if they themselves are not able to describe what's happening to them. They have to turn to someone who's a professional in the same way that I think probably everybody in this room would if we had cancer and we went to an oncologist who would describe what was happening in our cells in some technical way, we would probably say, okay, that's a better description of it than my description because I don't really know what's happening in my cells. So I'm, it's okay with me to substitute that language because it's more precise. In the case of psychiatry, it's not so much that it's more precise, it's that it's different and it's pathologized. That's the key thing. Now, one of the things I want to emphasize is that we're living in a very exciting moment in psychiatry's history. And it's uh, an example of the uh, effect of unintended consequences. I was talking a little while ago about the uh, long-stay asylums that people used to be in. Now, when patients were locked up for long periods of time, um, of course, this interfered with people's ability to meet together with one another and share their experiences and come up with alternative ways of understanding. If you were in a locked ward, you know, maybe you could talk to the other people on your ward, but you certainly couldn't go to a conference and talk to a lot of other people who have been in the same situation as you were. So one of the un unintended consequences that sociologists and economists and so on who have talked about the, the budgetary and other consequences of the hospitals closing, one of the unintended consequences has been that if people are not locked up for long periods of time, they can collaborate. They can come together. They can be just as we are here in a place where they can freely meet together, they can write articles together, they can publish things, they can have conferences, they can have think tanks, they can have all kinds of collaborative endeavors in which, just like doctors can, you know, if you go to a meeting of the British Psychological Society or the American Psychiatric Institution, we could say that's a peer support meeting for professionals. And that's where they get their ideas, and that's where they can work together, and they can write articles together, and so on. Well, now it's possible in the last 20 years, 20, 25 years, when these long-stay asylums have closed, it's possible for people who were patients to get together and to come up with their own alternatives. And here, it's only in the last 20 years or so that we see a tremendous increase, not only in first-person accounts of madness, but in organizations, in research efforts, in opportunities for people who really want to forge an alternative way of understanding things based on lived experience. The key thing that I'm trying to say today um, 
is you know one could one could argue that um, uh, I'm trying to argue partly on sort of grounds of democracy that we should pay attention to firsthand accounts of madness because they're there and because it's only fair to pay attention to everybody I, I am saying that but I'm saying a more important thing I'm saying we should pay attention to these accounts because they'll change our ideas about how to think about madness. It's not just we should listen to everybody in the room. I mean, that's always a good thing. But we should listen to everybody in the room because our ideas will be advanced if we do this. If we only listen to psychiatrists and other mental health professionals, we'll have a very narrow set of ideas about how to think about the mind and how to think about what can help people who are in distress. If we listen to people with first-hand experience, we'll have a much broader set of ideas. And, I'm going to argue, in some cases, we'll have a better set of ideas. That's really the key thing that I'm trying to say. <laughs>